Well, the Israeli president also called on the international community to refer to Hamas as what they are, terrorists. His plea comes as the BBC continues to face widespread criticism over their refusal to use the term. Corporation's World Affairs editor, John Simpson, attempted to defend the BBC's decision, saying, calling someone a terrorist means you're taking sides and ceasing to treat the situation with due impartiality. The BBC's job is to place the facts before its audience and let them decide what they think honestly and without ranting. But four of Britain's top lawyers have complained to Ofcom about the BBC's stance, arguing that it has, in fact, abandoned impartiality. Well, the BBC refuses to refer to Hamas as terrorists, even though the royal family have done so. So has the government. So I want to know from you, what is your reaction? Give me a call on 0344 499 You can text me on 8722, or you can tweet me on X, or whatever it's called this week, at Talk TV. Delighted to say in this uh, first hour, the barrister and Tory peer Lord Wolfson joins us on the uh, show. He's one of those who's complained to Ofcom. And also joining me over the next couple of hours is uh, former Tory party special, well, Tory government special advisor, Charlie Rowley. Uh, good afternoon to both of you gentlemen. Thank okay. you so much for joining us. Um, this row over the BBC, uh, uh, Lord Wolfson, um, I, on one level, it's rather petty, isn't it? We're talking about, you know, people being massacred in their beds confirmation we've seen overnight uh, that these stories about children being beheaded, babies being beheaded in their cots, being confirmed true by numerous different sources. The most horrific events. Horrific events also for the people of Gaza, right? Now, the innocent civilians in Gaza who are dealing with uh, the, 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 the penalty that, ha that Hamas, I would say, has brought on them. Does it really matter whether the BBC, say, militants or terrorists when they are telling the full story. You are one of the uh, four KCs, along with Lord Panic, Lord Grabner and Jeremy Breyer, uh, who has written to Ofcom, basically saying you need to investigate the BBC for, they, for refusing to use the word uh, terrorist as, as a legal factual definition. Does it really matter that much? It does matter, and it matters for two reasons. First of all, words matter. Words are what we use to designate how we categorise things. And if you categorise somebody as a terrorist, that's different to categorising them as a militant. And that's why, as a matter of law, we have prescribed Hamas in this country. Hamas is an illegal terrorist organisation as a matter of law in this country. So the first reason is, the first reason why it matters, is because words matter and identifying things matter. The second reason why it matters is because the BBC has used the word terrorist in other contexts. Um, I saw this morning, uh, for example, there was an article published in The Guardian back in 2005 where Roger Mosey, who was then head of BBC Television News, explained why the BBC was using the <laughs> word terrorism and terror and terrorist to describe what happened on the streets of London. And what happened on the streets of Israel on Saturday was, I'm afraid, far worse than what happened on the streets of London. I mean, these are both appalling incidents. In scale and brutality. In scale and brutality. Yeah. I mean, what happened on the streets of Israel on Saturday was a pogrom. There were more Jews were murdered, and I use that word deliberately, on Saturday than on any day since the Holocaust. Mm. And the parallels are striking. The killers went from house to house, shooting people on their sofas. And if they couldn't get in, they started the, to burn the house to smoke them out. We last saw things like that in the Warsaw Ghetto. And that's why I think the BBC is absolutely wrong in refusing to use the word terrorist, yeah. both because it's the right word and because it's the word the BBC uses in other contexts. They've happily used it in many other contexts. And it's interesting, as you say, look, it is the, it is the correct word in this country and in a number of other countries where Hamas is a prescribed terrorist organisation. That is what it is legally, factually. Um, the King, um, in a statement, talked about the barbaric acts of terrorism. Uh, Prince William and his wife Kate, they spoke uh, in a statement about how they're profoundly distressed by the horrors inflicted by Hamas's terrorist attack. They found it very easy to use that language. Um, the Labour Party leader, uh, Keir Starmer, found it very easy to use, use that language. So why do you think, if the BBC is happy to use that language on other occasions, why do you think on this occasion they're not happy to? What does this tell us? Well, that is the really big question. And, of course, it's a question which the BBC has not answered. Because all the BBC does is say, well, look at our guidelines. But as I've just said, the guidelines do not preclude the use of the word terrorism. So there must be some other reason why they are concerned to use it. Uh, I simply don't know what that reason could be. They haven't come up with one. Uh, and it's difficult to invent one for them. It seems to me that this is the most obvious decision 
that the BBC could make and should make. As you say, yeah. everybody from His Majesty down has used that word across the political spectrum. This ought not to be a matter of controversy. This isn't the first time that the Jewish community in the UK has had concerns about BBC coverage of uh, any, well, any issues related to either Israel or indeed to Jewish people as well. Uh, there have been incidents of, uh, of race, quite clearly, blatantly anti-Semitic racist uh, attacks uh, in, in the capital city and elsewhere, where the reports have been... Well, there was a report about how some Jewish children, Jewish teenagers were, were shouted at, were abused racially uh, by some, there were some Muslim kids, uh, Muslim youngsters, um, and it was claimed by the BBC repeatedly and completely factually wrong that they, they had been shouted at initially by the Jewish kids. That was proven to be uh, not true. There, were vi there was video evidence. It wasn't a he said, she said. It was factually untrue. And even though that evidence was sent to the BBC, it took them many months to actually backtrack on that and to apologise. And again, what does that tell us? This, this, is, this is an ongoing concern about the BBC's attitude towards, towards Israel in particular, but also to Jews in this country. Well, I think there is an issue with the BBC's general coverage. Uh, for example, the Bowen report, which was the internal report where designed to look at uh, what had gone on has never actually been published and the BBC has consistently refused to do so. And, and if it was exonerating the BBC, surely they would have put it out there quite happily, on their website, on every news programme, etc. Well, I'm a lawyer. If you have a good argument, you normally promote it. And if you had a bad, bad argument, you normally hide it. But the, the, I don't want this to get caught up into coverage of Israel-Palestine generally. Yeah. My focus is a very particular focus, and it's that what happened on Saturday was terrorism, mm -hmm. and it should be called out as such. As a result of what happened on Saturday, Jewish kids today in London are not wearing their school blazer because they have a Star of David on. Jewish restaurants have been attacked, kosher restaurants. The Jewish community is feeling vulnerable. And we do look to our state broadcaster, not to protect us, but at least to tell it how it is. That really ought to be the BBC's function. I want to talk more widely about the response of Israel as well, but let's bring in Charlie Rowley. You know, you were a your government advisor, originally to, to Michael Gove in government. Uh, you're the sort of person who would be you know, advising government ministers on on a whole range of issues, and mm. these are the sort of issues that come up. You know, that, that that you have to they have to come up with a stance on. Um, what do you make of the BBC just basically just defying the government, the, the Buckingham Palace and others to insist and almost alone that these people are not terrorists? Well, when you have situations like this, what people need across the country is leadership. Uh, and it's not about taking sides, it's about reporting the facts. And as you say, when you've got the head of state and the, you know, the king, King Charles, where you wouldn't normally be involved in political matters or any kind of politics, you know, when he has called these barbaric acts, uh, acts of terrorism. Uh, Prince Charles, uh, 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 Prince William and, and Kate have said the same. Uh, that that is... would have been agreed in advance. There, there's a, there'll be a lot of talk between the courtiers absolutely. and Number 10 Downing Street oh, about what, what, what can be said, what can't be said, what would be seen to be too political. It, it, exactly so. So, you know, the fact that they've been able to call it out for what it is uh, leaves the BBC, um, uh, I think, you know, uh, in a bit of a state itself because it's not reporting what is clearly uh, the facts. And, you know, you, you're, you're, you have to report everything. There will be individuals uh, and, and people on both sides where uh, uh, there will be victims, you know, innocent people will lose their life because of mm -hmm. conflicts. But when you see and when you hear uh, families and parents of children that have um, uh, died uh, saying that, that, you know, that, that they're in tears because being murdered would have been better than any other atrocity that they might have gone through, being dragged through the streets, brutally beaten, uh, possibly raped as a young child. You know, the fact that parents are saying, well, you know... Thank God my child's been killed. And not it's anything else. It's an extraordinary else. thing, It is it? an extraordinary thing. And that is because these are totally barbaric acts, and I think the BBC really does need yeah. to sort of step up to report and, it for what it is. And it's not a contradiction, is it, uh, Larissa, to, to, to be concerned, as I am, and I think most right-thinking people are, concerned about the plight of the people of Gaza. Now, horrific events in Israel, absolutely unacceptable, unprovoked... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I, anyone going back to the long history between Palestine and Israel, if you think that that justifies what happens at the weekend, you need to take a long, hard look in the mirror yourself. Um, but, um, but, but when you look at it, actually, the, the impact of this is going to be felt much more harshly on innocent men, women, children. Half of the population of Gaza, the 2.3 million people there, are children, uh, mainly because people don't live very long there. <laughs> you can't get hold of any medicine or contraception and things like that. So they are now out of electricity. The last power plant closed down overnight. 
um, no fuel coming in, no food coming in. There is no running water. Fresh water supplies are running out. They are short of medicines. They have seen a huge scale of not just death, but also of mass injuries from the bombardment by Israeli jets and missiles. Um, the thing is there is that you can, you can sympathize with that and argue whether that is the right or wrong thing while still referring to the original atrocity as an act of terrorism. Well, that, that is precisely the point. I mean, there is no contradiction between um, feeling that uh, innocent civilians are caught up in this, and innocent civilians are going to be killed on both sides. Yeah. That is the tragedy of the Middle East. Innocent civilians were killed on both sides in World War II. There was devastation in many cities in Germany. But the reason that devastation occurred is because we were fighting back mm -hmm. against Nazi atrocities. And the reason why... I'm afraid civilians will be killed in Gaza is because Israel is defending itself against the atrocities of Hamas. OK, well, let's talk about proportionality. That's been a, a big debate over the last couple of days. Um, is it proportionate? You know, you're, you're, a, you're a lawyer. I know you don't deal with sort of the international side of things normally, but, but is it proportionate for Israel to basically say, we are going to starve you out of Gaza and, and do whatever we have to do to get our hostages back and to destroy Hamas? Well, I mean, I, I don't speak for the Israeli government. Of course not. Um, but what I would say is this. When you're faced with a terrorist regime which has taken over an area and is using its schools and its hospitals as human shields, is firing rockets at you from hospitals, is hiding its commanders in schools, has built an in intricate level of tunnels, not to give the people protection, but to hide themselves, the commanders and members of Hamas. It's an extraordinarily difficult situation. I, I would hope that Israel defends itself as hard and as firmly as this country would defend itself if these things had happened to us. OK. Charlie Rowley, I mean, some people are saying this is retaliation, this is revenge. Both the Israeli government and our government and America are saying that this is, this is a matter of defending themselves, the right to defend the state of Israel. We've seen Anthony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, arriving in Israel today. There's going to be a joint press conference later. Uh, we had our own Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, in Israel yesterday. There'll be a lot going on behind the scenes about help and aid, but also, I imagine, quite a lot of also of trying to calm things down as this inevitably spirals, many fear, out of control. At what point do you think will the international community say, that's enough now, Israel. Uh, or will they not do that at all? Well, I think um, it, it, just reiterating the point that, you know, it's the innocent civilians on both sides that, you know, you have to um, uh, think about first and foremost. Yeah, an eight-year-old eight -year kid growing up in Gaza isn't responsible for those atrocities. It, 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 exactly so. And I think that Israel absolutely has the right to defend itself on the back of what we saw from Saturday and beyond. Um, but there, there, there has to be a conversation at some point, I think, where you say, look... Uh, why has this happened? You know, Hamas wants to destabilise all of the good work that's taken place over the last few years, where there was a, we're talking up to a point where Israel and Saudi Arabia were going to do a deal just to try and bring, uh, you know, slowly and steady peace across uh, the whole of that region. Hamas want to, and the reason why they've acted in such a way that they did was to totally wreck that process that was going in uh, what everybody, I think, could agree was the right direction. Now, do you want to put all of that at risk? Can we come to a situation whereby, of course, Israel should be defending itself, but if it is the case that hostages are released, uh, could it be the case that, you know, that prevents uh, a troops going in on the ground, a ground invasion, a ground incursion? We'll have to wait and see. So, uh, you know, tensions are obviously very high for understandable and for the right reasons, because this is an act of terror uh, from Hamas, but... Protecting innocent civilians, I think, uh, has to be front and centre of that conversation. Is there any we, way that we can... We talk about people in Gaza have been told to you know, get out of Gaza. Well, they can't. I mean, the border's shut with Israel. Um, the Egyptians have closed their borders, something we've raised on the show this week. is I find it extraordinary that there's criticism of Israel for closing uh, the, the, the access to in and out of Gaza. But, no, it's absolutely fine for Egypt to do it. Uh, No-one is calling on the Arab states to, to, uh, to help the people of Gaza. Um, is, is there a possible possibility of some sort of corridor, not just to get medical aid in and food and vital supplies in, but actually also to allow children out? Well, Was the scale too big? I, I, I don't know, but I, I'm afraid I think the scale probably is too big. I mean, the tragedy is uh, I have been associated with peace groups in Israel, uh, both financially and politically, for some time. Mm -hmm. What has happened has put the cause of a two-state solution back, yeah. back a long way. And I think what we need to recognise is that the only way, actually, to get a two-state solution back on track, if we can, 
is to make it very clear that Hamas and its supporters have really got no place in the future Middle East. Yeah. Uh, and that means, I'm afraid, that Israel has to win this war and has to win it decisively. Can I ask you just finally, Lord Wolfson, um, you are, among other things, you're a barrister, you're a Conservative peer, you're also chair of the Football Regulatory Authority at the Football Association. A lot of pressure on the FA to acknowledge that England's uh, match at Wembley on Friday, um, the, this awful massacre, as they've done before, they've lit up uh, the, the Wembley uh, famous arch with uh, you know, the, the Ukrainian uh, flag colours, with the French tricolour after the Bataclan, attacks as well uh, and yet they 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 feel very uncomfortable it appear about acknowledging this atrocity and we're told because they fear a backlash you know you're involved with the FA uh, what do you make of that decision well I was not part of that decision uh, I am involved in the FA uh, and I'm extremely uh, troubled by it uh, and that that's an understatement the statement which the FA have put out today uh, says that they refer to the devastating events over the last few days. A devastating event is when a coach goes off a cliff uh, or where some natural disaster happened. Uh, what happened, going back to the previous discussion, was terrorism. The FA had moral clarity when we had the Paris attacks. When young people were gunned down in a Paris nightclub, we lit the Wembley Arch. When young people have been gunned down and raped and worse at a music festival in Israel, for some reason, the FA have not found it within themselves to flick the switch on the Wembley Arch. And I think it's absolutely shameful. It ought to be a badge of shame on the FA for time to come. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Lord Wolfson, can I see more from you, Charlie, really throughout the show.